You're listening to Three Days Through the Wood, a novel by Bear Mawasagi, as read by the author. Chapter 4. A Casual Habit of Noonlit Walks Pill wondered if Chirp had ever run out of things to say. Have you ever seen a mushroom like that before? The young boy would ask him, pointing off far into the wood. Do you think it's eatable? I think I could eat it. You probably shouldn't, Pill would say. It was a catch-all response to Chirp's nonsense, like a vocal stamp sealing their correspondence. No, Chirp, that's probably dangerous. You probably shouldn't try fighting that deer. You probably didn't learn to swim by falling off the bridge, and you probably shouldn't try it now. His eyes were glazing over all the mushrooms and roots and fruits and berries that the boy found by simply frolicking along the road's edge, instead watching for signs of things vaguely defined in his mind, such as the silhouettes of straw hats. The small dirt path wound through a shroud of trees near thick as the morning fog, which was finally subsiding back into the earth as the sun continued to rise. The light was nearly blinding now when you could see it, and all that remained of the mists were small pools lingering in the deepest shade. The forest canopy was thick with only sparse gaps through the leaves, giving the forest a feel that was both cold and warm at once, dark and light together. He pulled his fleece tight against the breeze, shivered hard, and wiped the sweat from his brow. His thoughts had been racing all morning, trying to conjure up something, anything at all, that might help him trigger an understanding of himself. The sense of old Grizzly's home had unburied a small part of himself, and with those awakening half-memories came a feverish curiosity about what else there might be left on Earth. Scent seemed to be key in unlocking those first memories, at least in part, but he wondered if other familiar sights and sounds, sensations, and something else might help him as well. All he had in the way of prompts, however, were the offerings of the forest. Those had been little help to him. What kind of tree is that? Chirp chimed in, running his hands over a thick trunk covered in oozing sap. It smelled sharp rather than sweet. Can you eat it? You probably shouldn't, Chirp, Pill droned automatically. Sensing that wasn't enough to stay the boy, he added, You might be allergic. I don't feel allergic. Chirp said in the overconfident and over-enunciated manner of a child feigning knowledge of new ideas. He gathered the sap between his fingers and ran the sample over to Pill, offering his detailed analysis of the situation. It's sticky. Yeah, I bet, said Pill, backing away from his grubby, grasping fingers. The way Chirp ran through the wood almost took the fear of being lost from him, because he made it look so fun. Watching the young child play and frolic and ask question after question made Pill wonder what he had been like in his own youth. Was he the same sort of child as Chirp, yelling excitedly about every new discovery? How had he reacted to a world that was still a well of untapped wonderment? He wondered if he had always been as afraid as he felt now. Somehow, Pill suspected he had always been more of the quiet sort. He almost thought he could remember something, a term someone might have called him once, an old soul. Perhaps he had been a dour-faced young gentleman, sitting on the swing set with all the grim determination of a soldier marching off to war. He wondered if he had had friends, and, if so, what they might have been like. Pill suspected from his own behavior that he probably never cared much for other people, and so he probably didn't make many friends. What he didn't stop to consider was that maybe this meant he cared all the more for those few he let in. Those like Chirp, for instance. I think I see someone out there the young boy said. Oh, traveler, well met! A voice called through the trees in response. Pill turned his gaze to them, spotting the many silhouettes of many someones making their way closer. He stood in front of Chirp protectively, recalling the words of Grizzly about dangerous things lurking in the wood. Stop that, Pill whispered. Chirp spat out a bushel of minty-smelling leaves. Hello, he said more loudly, waving to the rapidly approaching strangers. Is there something we can help you with? Oh, no, oh, no, not at all, said one of the strangers. As he came into the light, Pill could see he was a golden-haired young man with a large, open-mouthed smile and ears that stuck out from the side of his head like two saucers. When he wasn't talking, his tongue almost dangled out past his lips. We're just out for a walk. What better weather for it? Cold but not snowing, bright but not hot. Could there be a better day? No day better than today, said the shaggy-haired stranger beside him. He was muscular-looking, with a broad build like a sideways grisly, but a shy smile stole all the edge from his features, and his voice was soft, pleasant even. "'Cause you never know what tomorrow will bring you,' 
said the third and final of the newcomers. She was smaller than the other two by far, smaller than Pill even, standing at about Chirp's height and looking just as excitable. There was a bounce to her step, of which she took seven for every one that the others made. Three were just to keep pace with them, and four were to pace about some more as she looked this way and that. She wore a large red bow that divided her hair into pomps and wore a similarly bright smile. Shaking himself free of the leaves and twigs that clung to him, the golden-haired man extended a hand. Shake? he asked. Almost instinctively, Pill obeyed. Chirp retreated behind his legs. Going our way? he asked them both, smiling. Pill looked to the trail of scattered foliage following their journey through the shroud. I'm not sure, he said. Well, if you're not, then you should join us, absolutely, said the excitable girl. Where are you headed? Not all walks need destination, said the shy one. That's right, agreed the golden hare. Take us, for instance. We're simply enjoying the morning breeze, regardless of which way it's blowing. Noon now, said the shy one. Has it been that long already? The golden-haired man scratched at his head before turning back to Pill. The name's Rover, he said, giving another wide smile. Rather accurately so, I would have to say, and these are my two faithful companions on the road, as well as newfound friends, Luna and Cooper. You could guess as to which is which, but I'll give you a hint. Cooper's the big one. Might I speak for all of us when I say it really is most wonderful to meet the both of you. Uh, thanks, said Pill, who sounded relatively quiet in comparison. Rover spoke like a man trapped in the far depths of a cave, or like a befuddled grandfather who forgets that telephones don't require the user to compensate for distance. Likewise, my name is Pill, and uh, this thing stuck to my knees here is Chirp. Auburn hair fluttered behind his fleece. No need to fear us, little fellow, said Rover more softly, which in his case was like the tranquility of a rock slide as compared to an avalanche. He dropped to a knee and started digging into his pockets. We are not hunters or ruffians roaming these fair woods, simply fellow wanderers in search of wonders. From somewhere inside his long, shaggy-looking coat, he produced... something. A gift, he said, smiling. Chirp was slow to emerge, but curiosity drew him out. The sight of the ball in the stranger's hand made him smile. After a moment's hesitation, he took it from Rover's hand with a furtive snatch and started tossing it into the air, still keeping Pill between himself and the stranger's. Since when were you so shy? Pill asked. You weren't this quiet when you met me. I thought you were a frog, Chirp croaked. Well then, said Rover, who stood up right again. Introductions are made and a gift is given. With that we could part politely, or perhaps we could partake of a pack progression through these preponderous woods. What do you say to that? Pill looked at them all incredulously. The three strangers carried themselves in a larger-than-life sort of way that stood at odds with the eerie chill of the forest, and, despite his better instincts, he found himself wanting to take their offer. Grizzly's warning was growing smaller and smaller in his ears until it was little more than a droning whine. He could feel the excitement of the strangers practically tingling in the air around them, and couldn't help but feel that they might be welcome company on the road. That sounds fine, said Pill. But it's not just up to me. What do you say, Chirp? Chirp emerged back from a nearby bush, coated in forest detritus of his own after throwing and retrieving the ball. He narrowed his eyes down to a squint at Rover, Cooper, and Luna. Pill dropped to a knee beside him and whispered, We don't have to go with them. If you're not comfortable, we can continue on by ourselves. It's okay. He did his best to smile, trying not to show his own hesitation at the thought of continuing alone. Chirp thought it over, humming and hawing while prying and passing the ball between his sticky fingers. Rover was the picture of politeness, having allowed an animated discussion with his friends about the singing of some nearby birds and how there were all sorts of squirrels out this morning and how much he would really like to take a swim somewhere, all while doing his best to pretend that Pill and Chirp weren't right there deliberating beside him. Another look at the ball in his hand sealed Chirp's decision. Okay, he said. Pill hid his sigh of relief and took the young boy's hand in his. He regretted almost immediately as Sap glued them together. And so the five travelers set off down the road together. I know I already asked, said Rover, sidling up to Pill, but I didn't give you enough time for an answer. Sorry about that, by the way. Bad habit. Where was it you and your friend were headed? We're going to town, said Pill. We've been walking all morning. Don't like towns, said Cooper. Too many people. Too much noise. What are you on about? Asked Luna, who was bouncing around his feet incredulously. Meeting new people is the best part of being anywhere. Don't like new places, 
said Cooper. Like home. Well, no matter where we go, we all find home eventually, said Rover, stepping between them. But in between those two extremes, we can find each other, and isn't that nice enough? Cooper and Luna both nodded in agreement. Sorry, Cooper said to Pill. New people are scary, but you're all right. Pill suddenly realized that the giant man looked just as afraid of Chirp as Chirp looked afraid of him. I don't like new people either, said Chirp. I always have to guess if they're going to give me something or chase me away. A lady threw a broom at me once, then she screamed until I left. That's terrible, tutted Rover. Someone threw a broom at you? Pill asked, incensed. He couldn't exactly blame someone for thinking about it, sure, knowing how Chirp could be, but there was a thick line between thinking something terrible and actually doing it that people usually failed to consider when weighing morality. Yeah, but I scared her first, said Chirp, going red in the face. She just wanted to check on her garden. I just wanted some carrots. We didn't expect each other. Well, it still wasn't right for her to throw a broom at you, said Pill, even if it was out of fright. Quite right, said Rover indignantly. Not right at all. People have always been rather accommodating with me. I once accidentally tore up a prize rosebush, careless walking, you see, and I hardly heard a word spoken against me. I like to believe that most people are, at heart, good, and that only undue circumstance can turn someone otherwise, but perhaps I've only been exposed to the good apples. I like apples, said Chirp, even more than carrots. Speaking of good and bad apples, said Pill, looking again to the forest, have you three met anyone else out on the road today? Well, no, said Rover, thinking it over. I do think I would remember, too. Cooper, Luna, how about the two of you? Didn't see anyone, said Cooper. If I saw someone, I would have already run up to them and said hello, said Luna, who was staring up into the trees at something. Chirp stared along with her. You would have heard me. Well, there you have it, said Rover. No one besides the three of us and the two of you. Couldn't tell you how long we've been walking before that, but it must have been a while. A thought struck Pill suddenly. He liked Rover's easygoing smile and the warmth that seemed to follow in the air around him. Something inside him wanted to trust the stranger. Taking the chance to dig, he walked a little closer. Hey, he said quietly enough so that only Rover could hear. Do you remember how you got here? Well, sure I do, Rover said very loudly. Pill visibly deflated. I remember it like it was yesterday, which it very well could have been, actually. I was out for a walk, you see, although I suppose I still am. I quite enjoy them and take them whenever I can. Anyway, I was on the road for some time. Couldn't say exactly how long. Time flies when having fun and all that. But eventually, I happened upon Cooper and Luna here. Or it might have been Luna and then Cooper. They were off for walks of their own, you understand, and we decided to walk together, much like the three of us joining the two of you. Then we all started running, because I wanted to get wherever we thought we were going a little faster. The problem was, we really didn't know where we were going at all. Each of us started following the other, thinking surely they knew where they were off to, and you know how those sorts of things proceed from there. We wandered off into the woods at a brisk pace with no idea where we'd ended up, and have been walking further still ever since. Pill nodded politely as Rover continued to ramble on before finally making entry to the conversation. Have you passed anything interesting during your walk? He asked hopefully. The face of the straw hat girl was still smiling at him through the mists of his mind. Oh my, yes, said Rover. Springs and rivers and ponds, even a lake, I think, or at least a very big pond. Plenty of good places to swim and wash and bake in the sun, that is, when you can find it. This forest is dreadfully thick, I'm afraid. I feel I've seen the sun more than I have the daylight. Yes, plenty of interesting things pass in this forest, but not much comes by in the way of good company. Forgive our earlier enthusiasm, but three of us were far more excited than we let on about running into others on the road. I'm afraid we might have come on a bit strong. Pill smiled. He liked listening to the golden-haired man talk. He didn't suspect he normally liked ramblers, but Rover had a musicality about him that made even his meanderings seem melodic. No, I was glad to meet someone, too, he confessed. It's just been me and Chirp so far, and an old man we met a while back. No, oh, so we're not alone after all, said Rover, smiling. Delightful! What was he like? What did he do? Where was he going? How far back on the road did you pass him? Let's go back, said Cooper. Luna nodded in excited agreement. Yeah, let's go meet him! Go back and go home, Cooper corrected. If I knew which way that was, I'd happily be leading the five of us myself, said Rover. But I don't, so I can't, and I won't pretend otherwise, although I'm happy to continue wandering in search of a favorable outcome. Cooper sighed and put his hands in his pockets. 
Luna huffed, but they both continued to follow dutifully. Yes, said Rover. Ashamed as I am to admit it, the three of us are, in fact, lost. Pill nodded in sympathy. Where are you from? he asked. Maybe they were from the same place. Maybe they could even help each other. Oh, it's a lovely place, said Rover. Large grounds, lots of trees, me and a small family sharing the space. I help look after the children, you see. Wonderful lads, really, and always so eager to play in the fields. I haven't seen them in some time, and I must say, I'm really looking forward to seeing them again. It sounds nice, said Pill. Do you live near a town? Does it have a name? Oh, we have neighbors, I suppose, but home is simply home. I wouldn't know to call it anything else. Home is as much a feeling as it is a place, you know? Part of me likes to think that means I'm still there, even now. Home is home, Cooper agreed. Even when the faces change or leave, said Luna. Even when everything's gone and everyone's moved on, home is home. But what about you, dear boy? asked Rover. You've hardly told me a thing about yourself. Here I've been going on and on about anything that comes to mind, and you're probably filled to burst with interesting facts and tidbits and stories about yourself you can hardly wait to share. I'm doing it now, even. Please tell me something about yourself before I suffocate the fires of conversation and my inane small talk. How about you? Do you enjoy long walks? Rover's rambling didn't buy Pill enough time to conjure up anything about himself. I think so, he said, forcing a smile. I wouldn't be out here otherwise, right? Rover chuckled. Luna howled with laughter. Cooper and Chirp were silent, however, keeping equally vigilant eyes on one another. Do you take them often? Rover asked. Walks, I mean. They're good for the Constitution, you know. And personally, I wouldn't mind knowing someone who has a mind for knowing the land. If it's unknown territory, I'm afraid I'm simply hopeless with directions. I'm lost too, Pill admitted very quietly. Well, there's nothing to be embarrassed about there, Rover said, waving his hand. You're young. That sort of thing is to be expected at your age. What matters is you take the time to find yourself. I didn't mean it like that, Pill started. Rover's advice was ringing true, however. I just meant I can't find my way home either. Well, the best place to start when you're lost is with what you know now. What can you tell me of home? Is it near a spring or a lake or a pond, perhaps? I don't know, said Pill. I don't remember it well. These things can be tough. Rover tutted softly. I suppose what matters then is how home makes you feel. What do you think of when you think of home? What does the word bring to mind? Not memories or people or things, but what you feel in your heart. Pill tried hard to see through the cloud of his thoughts, but nothing came to mind. Rover was patient, however, and watched with simple eyes and simple thoughts as Pill struggled to find an answer. The key, it turned out, was to not think at all and wait for the feelings to come. Home, Pill felt, was a word that made his heart ache. Home makes me sad, he said. I am really, truly sorry to hear that, said Rover. He laid a hand on Pill's shoulder. Sometimes we run not for pleasure, but away from the things that hurt us. Home can be a difficult place at times. It's where our hearts are most on display, most vulnerable. It can bring you love and warmth and happiness, but we face our most difficult trials there as well. I hope your sadness is only homesickness, a longing for a comfort you might find again. I think that's part of it, said Pill. But all the stuff you say about home, I, I don't know that it fits. I don't think I ever really belong there. It doesn't feel like home for me. Not home at home, said Rover, tilting his head. That's a tough one. I think I always wanted to be somewhere else, said Pill. He didn't know where the words were coming from, but the feeling was true, and he followed it. To be something else, like where I was and who I am weren't quite what I was supposed to be. I think I'm still looking for home. Well, you're in the right company for it, said Rover. We're all looking for home, too. Luna and Cooper and Chirp had all eased into a frighteningly fast and familiar sort of friendship with each other in the time Pill and Rover spent talking. Chirp was now perched atop Cooper's broad shoulders, poking a long stick into the branches high above while Luna ran about gathering apples and acorns and other things as they fell from the trees. Well, said Rover, clapping his back. His voice was loud again, and Pill wondered when it had become so quiet. No sense in dwelling on dwellings and the feelings about them. The past is the past, and it can't be changed, I'm afraid. All we can do is chart our course on the road ahead and hope that what we find might reconcile what we left behind. And if not, well... May happier times lie ahead. 
Who knows, maybe all the paths we walk wind back around on themselves. Where we started might look very different when approached from another direction. Sometimes I think a change in perspective is all we really needed. If the path should wind back home, maybe we'll see what was missing from it in the first place. Rover tugged at his jacket sharply and cleared his throat. Cooper and Luna stood at attention while Chirp scurried down to the forest floor. There were enough apples gathered for all to share. He handed a brightly red and large, particularly crispy-looking one to Pill. I think I hear a stream nearby, said Rover, his ears perked. Might even be a river. I must say I am due for a wash. How about the rest of you? I could go for a splash, said Luna excitedly. Maybe even a swim, a long swim, and a really, really big splash. Thirsty, said Cooper. Oh, Chirp chirped. He started digging through his pockets. You should have said something sooner. From beneath his baggy sweater, he pulled out a golden bottle of mead. Did you take that from Grizzly? asked Pill. He gave it to us, Chirp said defensively. He said drink as much as you want, and I was still thirsty. And it's not like I took a full one. And he gave us so much stuff that I thought it was okay. I'm pretty sure I asked him anyway. Out loud? I'm not sure. All right, said Pill. While he was trying to sound stern, he had to fight not to smile. You didn't steal it, but you should make sure you ask out loud before you take something, all right? Okay, said Chirp. He turned to Rover. Can I keep this ball? Of course you can, said Rover delightedly. I've had more curveballs thrown my way in life than I know what to do with. If there's one thing I know, it's that there's always another one on the way. You're free to hold on to that one in the meanwhile. Cooper nodded sagely. Always another ball. The sun was in the center sky when they parted, judging from the lances of light falling through the treetops. The air was warmer, and the mists were as low as they would fall. The road was bright with life, and, in the far-off distance and through the dark shadows of the trees beyond, Pill saw no hint of the straw hat girl. Promises of rivers and swims and a good splash departed Rover and Cooper and Luna as quickly as they'd appeared, and they bounded back through the forest after only a brief farewell. Pill couldn't help but feel he was parting with a friend he had known for a long time, even if they were entirely unfamiliar with each other. He and Chirp continued to follow the path in search of whatever waited ahead.